So today we're going to have uh, our second uh, message in the book of Ruth. I think I'm going to make it. I know Elena did not believe me uh, last week, but I think we will make it in three uh, through the book of Ruth, I think. So we're at least on track to. So anyways, uh, we will be in Ruth chapter 3, uh, verse 1, all, and we will be going through chapter 4, verse 10. And so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I kind of have this graduation stuff on my mind because we've been steeped in that the last couple of weeks. And so the first thing, uh, first thing that I want to say to begin the sermon is just congratulations to Will and Noel. Is you, you have made it through Babylon. You went through... I mean, I, I feel like I feel like I feel like these parties and the graduation on the same day is like this really good picture of of what it's been like in high school. Like the graduation ceremonies have a lot of false teaching and 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 darkness, and then the parties have the people of God and celebrating you and being there for you and all the different ways that God has brought people into your life and celebrating His goodness and you guys made it through high school and I don't think I need to remind you that high school did not go according to your plan. Some of the things that you went through in high school was worse than what you thought. Some of it was very disappointing. Some of it was super discouraging and frustrating and difficult and maddening. Um, and some of the things that you experienced in high school were a lot better than you thought. There were some surprises. There was relationships formed in times you encountered God and in His Word and learned about it and things God did that were good that you weren't expecting that. And friendships you made that were surprising to you and maybe friendships you lost that were surprising to you. And it, why did it happen? At the deepest ultimate level, it happened because it was God's plan. And you were walking through what God had for you. And every person who walks through high school as a believer, you walk through it in faithfulness and God uses your faith and he uses your obedience to bring all kinds of glory to himself. I mean, or to himself. There we go. I guess I'm a polytheist now. Uh, to himself. There were times that you guys stood up for your faith and you proclaimed Christ to your peers in ways when it didn't make you popular, in ways where not only did it not make you popular, but it made you unpopular, and it made you lonely, and it isolated you, and all, all those types of things happened. But God was faithful through all of that. And like you guys may not ever hear it, but when I did not go through high school as a believer, and I remember distinctly conversations with people in high school or conversations with people um, shortly after high school about God that I didn't receive what they had to say. But when God saved me later in my 20s, I remembered all that stuff. And it started coming back to me. And so all of the ways you guys have been faithful, even if you don't see immediate results now, know that in God can still use that stuff in the future. And so as you've made it through high school, the good you, you experience the goodness of God not in some things, in, you experienced it in all things. The hard things, God was good to you. The good, the, the fun things, the enjoyable things, God was good to you. The kind of meh things, uh, eh, God was good to you in that. You've, it, God's goodness has been the theme of your high school journey. The other thing that you've experienced is the unstoppable force of God's word. God's word went out like crazy during your high school life. Like, I mean, hugely. And those whom God was saving were saved. And those who were already saved and were growing in His grace, God used His Word to greatly impact and grow. And those who were hypocrites and false, God used His Word to expose and harden and judge. God's Word never returns to Him void. It is always accomplishing its purposes. And God's Word has been dominating your high school journey. You have all seen the true power of his gospel throughout your high school journey. Just even in our day, we uh, we baptized Brandon 
uh, here at the church. We baptized Tim. Sam was baptized when we first, uh, uh, early on when, when you guys, you guys uh, were coming. We've, we've seen God save people. We didn't see him save 10,000 people, but we did see God, uh, his gospel went out and had effect. And we also saw just God's sovereign reign was on display. He had everything under control and in his plan and in his word, guiding and leading all things every step of the way. And now as we're fixing to go into, as you guys are fixing to go into the next phase of life, as I mentioned last week, this next phase of life, it's not going to go according to your plan either. Just like high school didn't. The next phase is not going to. It's okay. Because just as God was good in high school in all the good things, the bad things, and the meh things, it's going to be the same in the next phase. And it's going to be the same in every single phase of life. His goodness and mercy follows you every day of your life, according to Psalm 23, 6. It's not, that's not ever going to change. There's nothing you need to be anxious about in relation to the future. There's nothing you need to fear, feel ashamed about or fearful about or discouraged about. Things are unfolding exactly how God has laid it out. And of course, as, we, as we've talked about these things over the last few weeks, it started it last week, we, we began the book of Ruth studying Naomi's life and Ruth's life and Naomi's life did not go according to plan at all. When she married Elimelech, she didn't plan on the famine, but a famine drove him to Moab. When they're there in Moab for 10 years, she didn't plan on Elimelech dying when he did. She outlived him by quite a bit. That wasn't her plan. When her sons married the Moabitesses, Orpah and Ruth, she didn't plan. Certainly, Naomi did not plan on her sons dying before her. Naomi definitely didn't plan on being all alone as a widow, left with her two daughters-in-law who were vulnerable. She said, it's exceedingly bitter in my spirit for your sake that the Almighty has testified against me. Naomi was devastated at the end of chapter 1. None of this was her plan. And then when she returned to Judah through these painful providences, she returns during the barley harvest. And when she goes back to Judah, Naomi is so despairing that she changed her own name. She said, don't call me Naomi, which means my joy. She said, call me Mara, which means bitter. And she said, because God has testified against me. She thinks God hates her. And she, here she is now back in Judah, an old elderly widow who can't have kids anymore. And she is now has Ruth with her, who is awesome. She has this faith in God and love for Naomi that is priceless, but Naomi feels a burden of how is Ruth going to be cared for? And she has no clue what's going to happen. And remember chapter two ends or chapter one ends with saying it was the barley harvest. And so when chapter two begins, we meet Boaz, who's described as a worthy man, the man who owns the field that uh, Ruth is going to go glean in. And as Ruth goes to glean in the fields, just following the providence of God, she's basically just going to work. She's just doing the next step. She's just going there. It's in that providence that God orchestrates her coming to the field of Boaz. And she meets Boaz, and Boaz provides for her, and he protects her, and cares for her, and he gives her lunch, and he sends her home with uh, he sends her home with provision. And when Naomi realizes, wait a second, this whole time God's been moving us to be connected to Boaz, who happens to be a near redeemer who can provide for us, she revives. And she comes to remember God hasn't forsaken her or the dead. And she's excited by the end of chapter 2. None of this was Naomi's plan. None of it was Ruth's plan. None of it was Boaz's plan. It was God's plan. And none of them could stop it. And God's plan was unfolding. And so, um, this is the review. Naomi realizes God is still good. He doesn't hate her. This is the things that we covered last week. And so now, as, as we move forward in the text, and as you guys move forward in life, you are going to need the faith of Naomi 
that can survive the hardest times. Even when Naomi's having her closest people die on her over and over again, and she's left in utter vulnerability, and she thinks God hates her, she never stops believing in God. She just thinks God, that she must have done something wrong or whatever. But her faith stays intact even when she's really, really struggling, and then later it's revived. And so you're going to need the faith of Naomi as you move forward in the next phases. You're going to have a lot of difficulty come your way and you can't let that rob your faith. And at the same time, as you move forward in your next phase, you're going to need the loyalty of Ruth. Ruth is greatly committed to God and to his people, even when there was no prospect in sight for things to go well for her on an earthly standpoint. All she knew was she wanted God and she wanted God's people and that's it. And she fully entrusted herself to God's care, even though she's probably, her and Naomi are the most vulnerable ones. And she's like, I don't care. I'm going to trust God and I'm going to stay committed to God and to his people, which for her, that was Naomi. And she entrusted herself. And you're going to face times where your God is going to test you. And he's going to put your faith and your faithfulness to him and, and your love for his people. He's going to test it. And he's not going to let you have any sight. He's going to test you. Are you going to stay faithful to me and stay faith and, and continue to love my people? Or are you going to compromise because you don't have all the answers figured out? Ruth did not sell out. She stayed faithful. And you're going to need that faithfulness as you move forward in life. And then the other thing is you're going to need the godliness of Boaz, who we're going to see here. He's so, he's so committed to the word of God that he puts it in front of himself and in front of his agenda. And so these types of people, Ruth's and Naomi's and Boaz's, you not only need to be these types of people, but these need to be your people wherever they come from. you got to be able to see what's really true about them spiritually. Like Boaz last week, who didn't just see a poor Moabitess, he saw the beauty of her faith. And wanted to care for her. You have to be able to see uh, with, with the eyes of, of God through the word. And if you can't imitate the faith and faithfulness of these people. And you don't have eyes to see. Then even though you've made it through high school with your faith, your faith intact. The next phase of trial in your life. It will defeat you. If you don't continue to walk by faith. What got you to this point. You can't drift from it. You have to keep doing what got you here and continue following the Lord. So um, to introduce, I, I need to give you, I'm not going to spend much time of it, but I'm going to give you three passages that we're not going to read. You guys can read them on your own at some time. Three passages from the law that are important for you to understand what's going to happen in the, in the text today. The first is found in Leviticus 25, verses 47 to 49. This was a law that said if a poor man in Israel, he owed a bunch of money, he could willingly sell himself as a slave to someone else to pay off his debts. And if a poor man had done that, and he has a kinsman, a brother or a cousin, a relative, a kinsman could come along and buy his brother back. He could redeem him from the slavery that the brother sold himself into. That's part of what, what's called a kinsman redeemer could do. Does everybody know what kinsman means? Yeah, we're good? Okay, so it basically just means relative. So our relative redeems him from slavery by buying him back. That was one area where a kinsman redeemer could function. Another way in which a kinsman redeemer could function is sometimes, according to Leviticus 25, verse 23 to 28, a, a Jew in the land would find himself falling on economic hard times. And when he did that, he would have to sell his land. Now, of course, this is important because we know this is the promised land, right? And so he would have to sell his land, the portion of his inheritance, when he fell on, on hard times economically. Well, if he had to sell his land, if he had a near redeemer, a kinsman redeemer, that kinsman redeemer could come along and buy that field that was sold. And then in buying that field, the kinsman redeemer would make sure that that part of the promised land would stay within that tribe. And so that was part of what the kinsman redeemer could do. And then lastly, according to Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 to 10, 
a kinsman redeemer would also redeem a widow. So if you have your brother marries a woman and he dies, now the nearest relative could pay a price to redeem the, the, the widow and then marry her and have children with her to perpetuate his brother's name. So he's kind of redeeming that line and offspring you know, for us. Now, when we read this in America, we think it's weird. Like, you know, you got your brother's wife. You know, remember, this is a different time of salvation history. And we've done enough through Genesis that you guys know land is a big thing. And genealogy is a huge thing at this time. And keeping those lines, those genealogical lines going, and that land and its proper inheritance is a huge priority under the Old Covenant and how things are functioning at that time. So those are... Those are very important things to keep in mind because some of the things that happen in the passage today, you need to know that background for it to make sense. So anyways, you guys can read the text on your own, but are there any questions related to that um, before we move on? Okay. Um, all right, let's go ahead and dive into the text into Ruth chapter 3, and we're going to begin by reading verses 1 and 2. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative, with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. So, Ruth is say, or Naomi is saying this to Ruth. After R Ruth comes home and brings the provision, the barley that, that Boaz gave her, and tells her what happened, this is Naomi's response after the testimony from Ruth. Naomi is now, when she's hearing all this, she's an older woman. She knows the word well. She's in tune with what God's doing. And so she tells Ruth, she's like, okay, this is my chance. I am seeking rest for you and provision for you. Sorry. She, um, sorry, my back is locking up. Um, Naomi wants Ruth to be married because as she comes to be married to this believer Boaz, she'll be provided for. And, and Naomi loves Ruth. And so now Naomi's kind of making it her mission to seek her blessing. This is, you know, a Christian matchmaker kind of thing that, that, that she's doing. And <clears throat> Naomi not only wants Ruth to be provided for, but Naomi knows the law. She knows that Boaz is a kinsman redeemer for them. And so she wants her to approach Boaz on, on this very night. And he, she knows that this night, the text says he will be winnowing barley at the threshing floor. So go talk to him. It's like, oh, heck yeah. That's, that's, the, that's the time. Who knows what's unique about the time where you're winnowing barley at the threshing floor. Yeah, me either, until I was studying it this week. So th this time when, where barley is being winnowed, barley that's usually being like crushed so that the seed and the chaff is separated from that and they start winnowing it. They'll like take a pitchfork and you throw it up in the air and the wind will take the chaff and blow it away. And then all you have is the seed that remains and the harvest. And when you are winnowing barley at the threshing floor, you do this at the end of the harvest. And it's a joyful time and a celebratory time. You know, we kind of turned this into Halloween, this idea of the, the harvest time. But this is supposed to be a joyful festival. So Ruth is supposed, Naomi's instruction to Ruth is that, okay, she, she begins her instructions by reminding her this is a joyful celebratory time for Boaz. And so here's some instructions for her, verse 3 and 4. She says, Wash therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your cloak, and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he's finished eating and drinking. And when he lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he'll tell you what to do. Heck yeah. Um, so here's this instruction. Take a shower. Dress up. Look nice. Look pretty. And go and approach Boaz. And the idea is that she's to be beautiful. And, and, and she, in her, she, she's, she's got her, you know, her nice clothes on. She's got her perfume on. And she is going because what's going to happen by the end of this, she's going to ask Boaz to marry her, basically. 
And so present yourself well. Take a shower, look pretty, and go to him. And then, hey, when he's laying down, uncover his feet. <laughs> okay. Um, I looked this up and wondered if it was some weird custom or something that I didn't know about. And honestly, the more I thought about it and looked at it, I think just uncovering your feet just wakes you up. When we read the story here in a minute, when she does it, that's exactly what happens is the blankets are pulled off his feet and it just kind of wakes him up. Like we think about it. If, you know, when you sleep and you're weird, it's like, oh, you, you might be the type of person I have to have my feet covered. And then like, you know, you pull the blankets back and your feet are uncovered and all of a sudden it feels all weird and it wakes you up. I think that's all that's really going on is, hey, take a shower, smell good, look hot and pull the covers off his feet and then he'll tell you what to do. <laughs> so if you weren't dealing with Boaz here, who's a really godly man, this might be a really bad idea. Like look all hot and smell good and while he's sleeping, go talk to him. It's like, that's probably not going to go great a lot of the times, but Ruth is a godly woman. He's a godly man. And so anyways, these are the instructions uh, from Naomi. So now as we move into verse six, we're going to see Ruth in actions. So here we go. Verse six. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just what her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. And at midnight, the man was startled and turned over. And behold, a woman lay at his feet. So here it is. She carries out the plan. He's laying by the heap of grain. I mean, where else would you lay? That's, uh, I guess that's, that's where you go to bed. And so she uncovers his feet just exactly like uh, Naomi told her to do. And now he's awake and he sees this woman. And here's what she says, verse 9. Or what he says, I'm sorry. He said, who are you? And she answered, I'm Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. This statement here, to spread your wings over someone, it has, or some translations, it says, spread your skirt over me, for you are a redeemer. This is a phrase that speaks to protection. If you look at Ezekiel 16, 8, I'm not going to read it, but God uses the same phrase towards Israel. He says, you were a young little girl, basically. And then when you became old enough for love, a woman, I, sp I spread my wing around you or my skirt around you. It's this cultural symbolic symbol of protecting her. It's kind of the idea in our day of I'm going to take you under my wing. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to... Um, in, in this context with these two, I'm going to marry you. And she's asking him, you know, spread your wing over me or take me under your wing, protect me with your wing, bring me into your home, provide for me, care for me, be my husband is what, really what she's saying. And so this is a, a marriage proposal from Ruth, or I'm sorry, yeah, from Ruth to Boaz. And Boaz knows it's a marriage proposal. And so here's, here's his reaction in verses 10 and 11. When she, um, sorry, I'm reading chapter 2, verse 10. And he said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first, and that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will, not, uh, I will do for you all that you ask. For all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. So here, in response to this, Boaz is pumped. And don't stumble over the phrase, my daughter. She's not really his daughter. It's the way that older people, an older man would talk to a younger woman that way. And, and, and so that's why he's using that phrase. It's not, it's not like incestuous or something like that. It's, so as he gets this proposal from her, he's an older guy. And she's younger than him. We don't know how much older. The text doesn't say. But he's surprised by it. Because he's older. And so being an older man, he doesn't think that this younger, pretty woman would want to marry him. And so I, maybe, I, I don't think I'm reading too much into this to suspect that as he's grown older, when you get older, you can start to have this feeling of uselessness. I have no future. I have no purpose. I, 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 don't, I don't know why I'm even around anymore. And maybe Boaz felt a little bit of that. Or he's older and he thinks... He's passed certain things, and now all of a sudden, by God's providence, here comes this 
pretty young lady who wants to marry him. And he's like, well, you didn't choose the young guys. You're cho choosing me. And he's pumped about it. He calls it his great kindness uh, done to him. And so I think at this point, I think it's super interesting how God has brought these people together. Let's think about our main characters. Naomi was widowed and lost her two sons and believed God hated her and had lived her life through a famine. Ruth is a Moabitess whom no one in Israel likes Moabites. She is super vulnerable and she's a widow. And now Boaz is an older man who thinks he has no future. Like these guys, they kind of look like losers in the world's eyes. Like they don't, these guys are together. They're sort of like weird. God doesn't have any purpose or any future for people like this. But oh, how he does. God has brought these three people together through very painful and difficult circumstances in a remarkable way. And he's just using the barley harvest to lay out his plan. Like they, they tried to miss God's plan. Ruth didn't want it. I mean, none of them wanted, you know, to be widowed, but it's what happened. Like they, they, that was never their plan. And God, God is taking life and bringing tragedy and bringing harvest and bringing blessing and doing all of these things to bring this thing to pass. He is the one who is orchestrating all of it. And the three most unlikely people have now come together and they are super godly. And God is doing wonderful things. Naomi's not hated by God. She has been, by her own words, not forsaken by him. Ruth is not, Ruth, the world sees in Israel a Moabite. She's not even a virgin. She's an older, you know, she's not a, she's not like a grandma, but she's not a young virgin, which is what they would have wanted to marry. She's a widow. So, you know, she's already been somebody else's wife. And, you know, that's what they see. And she's super vulnerable. And Boaz is an old, older guy and just eh. but there's all this beauty in him Ruth has a faith to go for in God and a loyalty to his people that surpasses probably almost everyone in uh in Israel Naomi is super faithful even though she struggles and then Boaz we've already seen is a man of great worth and virtue they were all weak, they all trusted God, they all loved God, they all follow God, and the Holy Spirit declares through the scripture their faithfulness and their worthiness in God's eyes. And so, as I already mentioned, for the graduation exhortation, this is the type of person you need to strive to be, and these are the type of people that you want to get close with and that you want to have as, as your people, because as they all come together, they bless each other. There's only three of them. That's okay. You got three of them, man. That's it, it's hard to find three people at all that are like this. And there's only three of them, but they've come together in these remarkable circumstances. And God is fixing to move in a wonderful way. So now let's go ahead and move forward in the story. And we know that Boaz was called a worthy man in chapter 2, verse 1. Now in, in verses 12 and 13 of chapter 3, we're going to read exactly why Boaz is worthy. Verse 12 it says, And now it is true that I'm a redeemer, yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight, and in the morning, if he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he is not willing to do redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. So here is his great response. This is why he's such a worthy man. Boaz wants to marry her. But Boaz puts the word and the law ahead of his own agenda. He says there's another guy who's a nearer redeemer. So in this context, when you're going to be a redeemer and you're going to redeem this wife and the land that Naomi's going to sell, the closest relative gets the chance to redeem her first. And then the more distant relative gets the chance if that closer relative doesn't take it. You didn't have to take it. You didn't have, it wasn't a compulsion, but they have the option to, to redeem her. And so Boaz knows this. And what I, why I see him as a worthy man in this is he is so excited about marrying her, but he knows there's a closer redeemer. And he's like, we need to tell this guy because that's what the law requires. And we need to do basically what God wants. And so Boaz is putting 
upholding the Word of God and honoring the Word of God and abiding by the Word of God, he's putting that ahead of his own agenda. He's not trying to twist everything and ignore the Word of God so that he gets what he wants. When Ruth is there proposing, he doesn't take advantage of her and sleep with her and transgress the law. That way he doesn't do any of that stuff. He honors her. He rejoices in the possibility of marrying her. And then he says, we're going to put the Word first. There's a nearer Redeemer. And Boaz now, though it's something he desires, he's now going to test this marriage proposal. Is this of God or not? He's going to test it by the word of God. And if the nearer redeemer redeems her, then Boaz is going to know this isn't what God has for me. And he'll move on disappointed, but in peace. And if it is what God has for him, then he knows I can't go grab this in violation of the word of God. And so I, I love Boaz for this, is he's a man who knows the word and he's a man who will look at the word of God. And if the word of God crosses his agenda or I mean, he didn't say crosses his sin, he's going to exalt the word first. He did not take advantage of her and sleep with her in this night. He did not try to trump the law to get what he wants. He's a true godly man who puts the word ahead of himself and he puts the word over the lives of other people whom he loves and he's going to stand in that word for himself. He's going to stand in that word for his future wife. This is what a man really is. And in our country, I think there is a great famine of men who are filled with the word of God. There's a great famine of men who live and breathe the scripture. There's a great famine of men who want God, who love God, who serve God, who make their decisions by the word of God, who surrender their flesh in obedience to the Lord. There's a famine of that. We have way too many dry trees in our land who know nothing of the word of God. And you, you talk to so many men uh, in the United States who say that they're Christians and they struggle to talk for five minutes about the Lord. They can't tell you about their prayer life and God moving in that. They can't tell you anything from the scripture that they're reading. It's just such a struggle to get one sentence out of them from the word of God. I've just had my fill of that stuff. We need Boaz's. Let me read Psalm 1. I want you to turn there to me. Listen to the description of this man in Psalm 1 and what he's like. Boaz is this kind of guy. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. So the first blessing pronounced on this man, he doesn't follow the word, the world. He doesn't listen to their advice. He doesn't take their counsel. He doesn't sit in their seats. He doesn't do any of that. He rejects the, the falsehoods of the world. And verse 2, it says, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. This man's obsessed with the word of God. That's his delight. His heart finds joy in the word of God. And he's thinking about it day and night. It's always on his mind. This guy's obsessed with the word. And he's called blessed here in the scripture. Verse 3. Now here's this description of his life. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither and all he does he prospers so this man's now described in figurative language he's a tree and he's planted in a river and this river a river to a tree is a source of life the water he's planted in the river so the water is always going over the roots of this tree giving it life and nourishing him and what is the river in context? It's the word of God. It's watering this man who's described as a tree. And so what's a tree like? Because he's so planted in the word. It says, he yields its fruit in its season and its leaf doesn't wither. So whatever season the Psalm 1 man is in, a hard one, a discouraging one, a season of harvest, a season of sowing, a season of encouragement, a season of blessing, whatever season he's in, his leaves are not withering. He's prospering spiritually. It doesn't mean he's always rich, but he is always prospering in the Lord. The Word is always 
triumphing in this man's life. The word is always leading him. The word is always guiding him and filling him and making him this type of a man. This is Boaz. And this is the type of man that our, 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 that our men need to aspire to be. And for our women, this is the only type of man you want to marry. Verse 4, the wicked are not so. They're like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Dry, withering trees who don't love the word of God, they're called the wicked here. And they're going to perish in the judgment of God. They're not going to stand. The only trees that stand through this forest fire of God's judgment are trees whose roots are in the river of God's word. Their leaf does not wither. They're in season all the time. There's always, some, no matter what is going on, the word is always living in them and speaking through them. This is the type of men we need. So Boaz here Returning to the book of Ruth, he is surrendering his will and he's surrendering his agenda to the word of God because he is a Psalm 1 type of man. Let's see what happens now. Verse 14 to 18. So she lay at his feet until the morning, but arose before one could recognize another. And he said, Let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. And he said, Bring the garment you are wearing and hold it out. So she held it, and he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her. And then she went into the city. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, How did it fare, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, These six measures of barley he gave to me. For he said to me, You must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. And she replied, Wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out. For the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. So here, as Ruth, or as Ruth returns to Naomi, Boaz makes sure that she has provision. She takes her outer garment and he fills it up. He fills it up with, with grain and she goes back and she's provided for. And this provision foreshadows what he's going to be to her as a husband. And here, at the end of, at the end of this, this evening, he's gonna, Naomi knows he's going to go settle what's going on this day. He means business. Boaz sees God moving. He knows that this might be something that God has for him, this marriage. He knows that Naomi and Ruth are in need, so he's not afraid of commitment. He's not dragging his feet. No, gee, man, I don't know, you know, all that stuff. He's a man of God. Once he senses God's leading, boom, he moved forward with action. And so that's exactly what's going to happen in chapter 4. Now, for Naomi and Ruth, Naomi's interpreting all this stuff. She's telling her, all right, just wait. He's going to deal with this. So for Ruth, who wants to be married, all her job, they've done everything they can do now. Now all Ruth has to do is wait. And what Naomi has to do is wait. They've done their part. Let's see what God does now. And so fortunately for them, they're not going to have to wait very long. Um, in chapter 4, Boaz is going to go tend to the matter. So let's go ahead and read verses 1 through 4. It says, Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Turn aside, friends, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I'd tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you'll redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one beside you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. So here, Boaz gathers this man in front of the ten elders of the city. The idea is he's having witnesses. In these Back in these times, they didn't have contracts like we have, where you have you know, 4,000 pages and you sign 52 things, and now it's a legally binding contract. It's customary. You have witnesses, and we'll see at the end of the, 
we'll see at the end of the story that you know a sandal comes into play to bind a contract but he brings these 10 elders to make what happens public and to make what's about to happen binding and so at first i told you guys in the beginning a kinsman redeemer the nearest redeemer could redeem someone from slavery could redeem the land that they are selling and could also redeem the wife okay so and, and to begin this boaz simply presents the land hey naomi's selling the parcel of land you're the near redeemer do you want it and this dude's like heck yeah he's a real estate guy you know he, he wants to buy it and so now now that 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 this this looks kind of this looks like a defeat and so boaz is going to add some more facts to the matter in verse five and six this dude wants to buy it well boaz probably feels some disappointment so he's going to speak up about naomi and ruth and boaz is going to do one of two things number one he's going to test this guy further to see if he really wants to do go through this and number two if the guy does Boaz is going to ensure that Naomi and Ruth are taken care of. So here's what he says in verse 5 and 6. Then Boaz said, The day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I can't redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Um... Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. So, here's the idea. You're redeeming the land as a kinsman redeemer, but we have this Moabite widow and Naomi that you also need to redeem if you're going to redeem the land. And this guy doesn't want to impair his own inheritance. Here's, what, here's the idea. If he takes Ruth to be his wife, who keep in mind is a Moabitess, I think that's... A big part of this. She's a Moabitess. If they have kids, now his own existing children will have to split the inheritance with these other kids he might have with the Moabite. And so the guy's like, I don't want to impair my own inheritance. He doesn't want to have to. He wants to pass on his inheritance to his existing kids. He don't want to bring any more kids into the picture, especially half-breed Moabites. So he's good. I'm good. You take it. And so... Here we are. Boaz has abided by the word of God. He has sought God. He has brought witnesses. He has done everything he is supposed to do by the word of God. And after testing this situation by God's word, it is very clear Ruth is the wife that God has for Boaz. He didn't have to manipulate anything. He didn't have to sin to try to get his way. He didn't have to hide or twist God's word. He just abided by it in all faithfulness. Uh, he, he, he did everything he was supposed to do. And now, boom, God's making a provision. And I doubt as you guys move on to the next phase of your life, I doubt any of our single ladies are going to go lay by some dude and pull the covers off his feet, you know, while you're all decked and say, you know, say like, you know, we're not going to do this in our culture. And I doubt any of our single guys are going to wake up with, you know, some lady at their feet saying, Hey, marry me. You know, that, that's probably not going to happen. But what we can take away from this principle is when you're looking at this stuff happening is look, God's providence. He knew how to bring Ruth and Boaz together. Who's the one doing this? What does Jesus say about marriage in Matthew 20? He says, what God has brought together, let no man separate. Boaz wasn't looking for Ruth. Ruth wasn't looking for Boaz. The barley harvest and the death of these relatives, God used all of it to bring them right at the right place at the right time. And neither of them had to compromise God's word. In fact, they were standing in it strongly. Ruth too, because she asked him to redeem her. You're a redeemer. She understood the word with that. Boaz went right by the word. They both put the word ahead of their agendas. They tested everything in God's providence by God's word. And what did God do? Now he's bringing about this marriage with two unlikely people. It doesn't matter that there was an age gap. It doesn't matter that he was a Jew and she was a Moabitess. That doesn't matter. What mattered is they both love God. They both honor the word. They both live by faith. They both, according to the text, are worthy. 
That's what matters. And now God's brought this marriage together. And so with graduation stuff in mind, after you graduate, the next phase you enter into, oftentimes, not always, depends on God's plan for your life, but oftentimes the next phase you enter into is this phase where you're considering marriage. Look at this story. If you really want to be married right now and you're not, I think this story can give you a lot of peace. God knows how to bring your spouse to you. And when he brings that spouse, it is the right one for you. If the woman is like Ruth and she has this heart for God and she has this heart for God's people like Naomi, she's evidencing forth her faith so much that even Israelites are saying about a Moabitess, this woman's worthy. And, and this is what you want to see in a woman. She's committed to God. She's committed to God's people. She's like a Proverbs 31. She got up early and is working in the fields and is gleaning and wants to take care of Naomi. She's full of good works. She's full of the word of God. She wants to walk by that. That's the type of person you marry. And then on the flip side, you want a Boaz if you're a woman. Here's a man who is, he has dignity, he's godly, he's strong, he's a worthy man. He stands by the word. He honors the word in all of his things. He doesn't take advantage of Ruth when she comes to propose to him. He's not trying to lead her in sin. He's not trying to stuff the word of God down to get his own agenda. He's opening it and he's bringing their, their relationship public, the, the, the potential of it. And he wants to provide for her. He's giving generously to her. He's eager to protect her. He's eager to care for Naomi. He's not trying to tear her apart from Naomi. He is loving her and serving her. This is the kind of man that you want. And they do exist even if they're rare. I, I'm sure it seems like they don't exist in America right now because it's so rare. But this was the time of the judges. And during the time of the judges, as dark as that time was, there was still a Boaz out there. And there was still a Ruth out there. And so, this is what they're doing. A life, day in, day out, surrendered to God, following Him in this next phase. That's how you prepare yourself to be a husband. That's how you prepare yourself to be a wife. And then for Naomi... She's not getting married. She's single. And she's going to stay single. And what is Naomi doing? Naomi's the same thing. She's just like following God and seeing what's going on. And she's rejoicing in all the things that God's doing. And she's being used greatly in this story as well. And so I just, for single people, for single people who will one day be married, like Boaz and Ruth, and for single people who one day not be married, like Naomi, God is working out this plan, and you can't miss it. And that is, I, I just think that's super encouraging and comforting. So now, let's read our final four verses here, and then we'll close. Uh, verse 7 to 10. Let's see how, how it all goes down now that this dude refused to redeem um, Naomi and Ruth. Verse 7, now this was the custom of in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm a transaction. The one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. And then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, your witnesses this day that I have brought I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Limelech and all that belonged to Chilion and to Malon. Chilion and Malon are sons. Elimelech was her husband. Also, Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have brought, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. So now here it comes. The guy refused to redeem her. It's time for Boaz to step up and do what he said he was going to do. And so he takes off his sandal because, again, that's the custom. That's the way you bind this and make it legal. He's kept his word. He didn't get cold feet. He didn't freak out. He didn't do any of that stuff. He is a decisive, godly man who sees what God is doing, and he jumps in and he does it with no hesitation. And so here we are. 
now they've been redeemed. Naomi is cared for, the older lady who stays single. She comes under the wing of Boaz. Ruth is cared for, will come under the wing of Boaz. We'll see next week. They're going to have a child, and it's going to be King David's grandpa. Life is going to come out of all of this death. That it's death and famine and hardship that brought them together, but the result will be life. And I, I just think it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful end to this story. So I'll say it again like I began with, their plan didn't matter. This wasn't any of their plans, but it was God's plan. And it was a glorious plan, and it was a Christ-centered plan. And my last thought here is when you are like Boaz and you walk by faith and you obey his word, you show people what Christ is like. Where do I get that from Boaz? Well, Boaz is a kinsman redeemer. If Boaz would not have paid the price to bring Ruth and Naomi into his under his wing, they would have perished. But Boaz pays the redemption price so that his bride, Ruth, can be with him. And so that Naomi can also be taken care of. Hmm, what does that picture remind you of? Christ, obviously. Christ is also a kinsman redeemer to us. He has paid the price for us to be brought to Him. He paid the price by dying on a cross. It wasn't taken off His sandal and given some shekels, you know, to buy a field. It was Him dying on a cross and bearing the wrath of God to redeem us from our sins. And as He did that, as a godly man like Boaz, He has redeemed us. Redeemed us from slavery to sin. He's brought us as the bride of Christ. The church is called the bride of Christ. He's brought us to be His bride. Just like Ruth was brought to Boaz, we are brought to Christ as our Redeemer pays the price for our sins. And Jesus only marries people like Ruth, those who are worthy. And you might say, wait, wait a second, I thought Jesus marries sinners, not those who are worthy. We just had our reading, we're not saved by our works. What's the worthiness of Ruth? She believes God. So much so that she's willing to put her well-being on the line when she has no idea how it'll work out. That type of person is though Ruth is a sinner, she's worthy in the sense that her trust for God is so strong that it drives her whole life. This is the type of bride Christ redeems. Those who trust Him, those who believe in Him for salvation and trust Him for their salvation, they trust Him for their life, and they trust Him for their eternity. That's a worthy bride. And that bride is redeemed by Christ and brought to Himself. Now, when Boaz marries Ruth, do any of us so foolish as to think he's just going to marry her? Okay, now you're my wife and then leave her and not be with her in her life and provide for her? Of course he's not going to do that. Well, it's the same thing with Christ. He's not going to redeem us and save us and then just abandon us and say, okay, you guys graduated. Figure it out. He's not doing that. Just as Boaz will continue to be the husband to Ruth, leading to life, Christ will continue with his bride. And whatever path you're on, it's going to lead to life and to his glory as long as you're following him and trusting him. And your story, just like, like this one, it's going to have many bitter providences and many painful difficulties, but it's going to have countless deliverances. And as you follow him, your life is going to become a picture of what Christ is like to other people. You're his workmanship, created in Christ for good works. You can't miss the plan. And so anyways, that's today. Next week, we're going to consider all the background of craziness that happens to bring Obed onto the planet. The baby will be born next week, and we will move it into... Uh, the birth of Christ. Um, but anyways, that's next week. Any questions or comments uh, from this stuff?
All righty. Well, let's pray and then we'll go to the table. Lord, we thank you for your providence. We thank you for your plan. We thank you that you are sovereign and you're in control of every single thing. You control the famines. You control the death. You control life. You control the harvest. You control where people end up. You control the who decides they want to step up and be a redeemer and who doesn't. You control marriage. You control babies. And we just rejoice over all of it, God. And we praise you for your goodness in this story, Lord. And we want to lift up not just our graduates. We, we especially lift them up, but, but, but all of us. I pray you will help us to live with the faith of Naomi, even in bitter times, we still don't leave you. And it doesn't take much to revive our hearts. We just need this sense that you still love us and we can be revived like Naomi. I pray you give us, like Ruth, this loyalty and faithfulness to you and to your people. No matter what, no matter what our eyes see, we stay faithful. And I pray you'd make us like Boaz, people of the word of God, who put it before all of our agendas, who are who use our strength and our riches to... Take people under our wing and protect them and be generous to them and love them and build them. Make us that kind of people that we might be a glorious workmanship uh, unto you. Lord, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.